Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Mizdahi and today we're going to talk about hacker rights. I'm going to share my slides with you in a bit, um, but in the meantime, I'm going to turn off my camera so I can focus on the slides. I'll see you guys on the other side. Welcome, welcome to Hacker Rights. Uh, once again, my name is Chloe Mustagi, and I'm the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. And when I'm not doing that, I'm an ethical hacker advocate. What does that mean exactly? I do whatever I can to see how can I improve our hacker community. Um, does that mean increasing those that are underrepresented and making sure that they have resources and rights? Yes. Does that mean also trying to get rights for ethical hackers, such as protections and whatnot? Yes. So that's what I like to do. Other than that, I am the president and co-founder of WOSAC, which is Women of Security. Um, and we have chapters all over the world, which is fabulous. Um, I'm also the founder of Women Hackers, which is a basically a virtual community of non-binary women that hack at all levels all around the world. When I'm not that, I'm also a parent, and you're probably wondering, what is a parent? It is being a parent to a puppy, or to any furry, or any a pet that you own. I'm sure like as a Shiba, you kind of see here and there in those photos on the collage on the right side, but also um, you might see some more photos of her. She's amazing. And last but not least, I'm also the organizer of the Hacker Book Club. We meet every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we read a book uh, written by um, someone in the hacker community, and the hacker community comes together and reads the book. And yes, they come and visit us. Um, that is my website, uh, kloemasaki.com, and feel free to DM me or follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, my DMs are always open. So now let's dive into the everything. Let's just put, say it, everything. And what do I mean by that? We need to go into the background, and we need to know how we can influence the public. Because right now, there really isn't any rights out there for ethical hackers. So the only way we're going to change that is by bringing public awareness and changing the stereotypes there with it. And of course, that means we're going to have to dive a little bit about the brain, how the brain responds to fear and prejudice, and how do you challenge those biases and those socially constructed beliefs? Um, last but not least, then we have to then talk about the three main players of making sure we get rights the role that the media has, organizations, and legislations. And then last but not least, what are the next steps that we have? Now, it's really important to note that when I say media, I mean marketing and I mean PR. Yes, that means marketing for infosec companies. Many of us work at infosec companies that they still use the black pretty imagery. So let's dive into that first. So what is a hacker? Usually when we see pictures of hackers, we see this image, you know, this guy in a very dark room and has this hood up and whatnot. Or this one. This one is my favorite because I don't know about you, but if you've ever actually had to wear a ski mask, it can be very itchy if you have sensitive skin. I can't wear one, so that's why I'm not really in snow often. But overall, in general, the other thing that really annoys me about this is that pretty much everyone knows now at this point, you can just cover your camera with a post-it or a piece of tape or even a cover. And I don't know why they still have that, so I always find that really interesting. But overall, I always try to tell people hackers come in all shapes and sizes. And that's the important thing to take away. And not to mention, hackers wear different hats. What does that mean? Overall, hackers wear three main hats. But when I usually say hacker, I'm referring to the white hats, the ethical hackers. In general, black hats, they commit malicious acts and are considered criminals. And we probably should start saying the term cyber criminals, not hackers. And gray hats, well, there's too many shades to cover. But in general, there are the people who are passionate about technology and finding bones as such is what made them into a hacker. And maybe many of them didn't know ethical hacking existed when they first started, but once it was discovered, their hats would change to a gray or a white shade. Now, what are ethical hackers? Let's just dive into this. White hats are hackers who want to keep data safe from attackers by finding system vulnerabilities that can be mitigated. 
White hats are usually employed by a target systems owner and are typically paid and sometimes quite well for their work. And yeah, sometimes we get just a thank you, which is fabulous, you know? But yeah, I know, sometimes it's cool to be paid out. Um, but overall, the main takeaway is that their work is not illegal because it was done with the system owner's consent or it was something within, you know, within scope that you never exploited. But even though ethical hackers are not malicious actors, they're still being seen and treated as such. And because of this, it reduces the chance of reporting a vulnerability and can cause hackers to go on the dark side because they're seen as the same. And you're probably wondering what? I promise I'll go into it in a little bit. But overall, I want you to pay attention to the left. This is what we see when we type in criminal hackers. And to the right, this is what we see when it's ethical hackers. And once again, hoodie and darkness. And they don't really look too different. And it's not just the imagery. It's also the language used in the media, such as seen in marketing and the press. And let's say, once again, that is media. So how does this imagery impact us? Well, let's first dive into your brain. Overall, there's this one part of your brain that I want to focus on. And in that highlighted region right there, you see it's kind of like orange, red, yellowish kind of hinge going on. That's your temporal lobe area. So the temporal lobe area itself is where your hippocampus is in your amygdala. Now the hippocampus is where you store your short-term memories, making it into long-term memories. And these are usually visual clues. For example, if someone used a phrase like, uh, something that is orange, part of a parsley family, and it's grown underground, carrot, right? So what happens is that you're basically able to process a description and connect a picture to it. So that's how you figured out it was a carrot. This happens in the temporal lobe. But also, the amygdala is part of it, and it works together, um, but it's subconscious, and it is where emotions tend to be held. So um, it's also known where our survival mechanism is. So the amygdala is basically, it's our survival mechanism of fight versus flight. And what do we know when we are in fear? Well, we've been trained at a very young age in survival mode to know who is like us, who's not like us. And if the person is not like us, doesn't dress like us, doesn't talk like us, and we never interacted with someone who looks like that or whatnot, we consider that person someone that we might be afraid of because we've never interacted with someone like that. And so we program that person into a fear category. Now, I want to state that these threat stems from socially constructed beliefs. What are socially constructed beliefs you're probably wondering? Well, it's basically the ideas that you learned as a child or as an adult. It's what's in the media. It's what you've heard from your parents, your family, a teacher, a friend. So anyone who tells you like you should be afraid of something, it's going to stick with you. So say, for example, you were told at a young age to be afraid of someone who has pink hair. Now, I know this sounds really weird, but just let's just bear with me here. So you're told at a young age that people with pink hair are dangerous individuals. You also see in the news that people with pink hair are possibly suspects of robbing or murdering or whatnot. Now, in your mind, you think of that person with pink hair as a dangerous person. And so when you see someone with pink hair, you might hold your purse a little bit tighter. You might cross the street or you might go into a store whenever you see someone with pink hair. Now, I want to reiterate this, is that this is a socially constructed belief. It doesn't mean that it is true. Most of the times, it could mean that it's false. Someone with pink hair just has pink hair. There's really no difference, right? But in reality, it's because we're taught at a young age to be scared of someone with pink hair, we will always think of that person with pink hair as someone who's a dangerous person. So our amygdala sends a message to the prefrontal cortex of our brain sending a warning. Now, what happens here? So remember the amygdala is subconscious, meaning that you're not aware that what's going on. You just have an emotion that's evoking a possible action. And that action possibility is being sent to the prefrontal cortex where it's completely now consciously aware. 
it is the part of your brain that acts kind of like the CEO that uses logic and reason to question the threat. So when you see the person with pink hair, you might you remember hold your bag a little bit tighter across the street or go into a store. Well, think about it this way. Your brain is then sending a message to the rest of your body in a sense, should I be afraid? And the thing is you're gonna go with yes, unless something's questioned. Now you're probably wondering, how do you question these things? Well, believe it or not, storytelling is the one thing research has shown over and over again is the best solution for questioning our prejudice and biases. So for example, say that you watch a YouTube video and it was someone with pink hair talking about how hard it is to be someone with pink hair because no matter where they are at all times, people see them as a threat and they see that they hold their purse a little bit closer or they lock their doors or they cross the street or they go into a store. You're officially now hearing the person who has been subjected to these these prejudices that have hurt this individual deeply and has definitely scarred that person. And the only way that you can change that situation is for you to look at yourself in the mirror in a sense and ask, what have I done to contribute to this? So when your prefrontal cortex is getting that threat after seeing the pink hair person, you're now in that moment where you look back, take a step back and be like, hold on, I remember watching that YouTube video of the person with the pink hair. I'm being just like one of those people. I need to relax. This person is probably not gonna hurt me at all. It's just prejudice and biases that are really running my brain right now. So then what happens is, is that the prefrontal cortex sends a message back to the amygdala to chill out. Now there are times where that doesn't happen, where the prefrontal cortex turns around and is like, no, act on this action. Now there's this other thing called um, uh, amygdala hijack. And amygdala hijack is when you suddenly are, you're in a car accident, let's just say. And if you've been in a bad car accident, you know what I mean by this. When suddenly time has seems to slow down in that moment where you watch something go very slowly at that moment, you are not aware consciously and making decisions anymore. You are now in survival mode of what is happening and you're fully focused in that moment. Your amygdala has taken over completely and you're running on emotions instead of rational reasoning. So just note that there are these things. But I want the main takeaway from this entire conversation is to note that it's you always have the ability to question your biases. And the only way that you can is being okay to be uncomfortable. Yes, it's very hard to realize that you're wrong. We don't like to be wrong. For some reason, it makes us feel very more insecure in our life, but it's okay. Because the only way that we learn is if we're comfortable with knowing that we don't know everything and it's up to us in our lifetime and our life's journey to make sure that we get to know the world that we live in. Because when we get outside our comfort bubble, we really do start learning about the world. Now you're probably wondering now like, okay, Chloe, now I know about the brain and everything, but what does that mean? What, why are we talking about this? Well, let me be honest with you. Instead of the pink hair, turn around and think of it as hackers. I mean, how many times have you guys gone somewhere and someone asks, oh, what do you do for a living? And you turn around like, oh, I'm a hacker. And they're like, they're, their eyes like pop out and then their like mouths drop and then they take a step back and then they get really silent with you. They were very charming at the beginning and now they're like, nope, you are someone who is devious and I don't trust you. And that's the same if you work in InfoSec or cybersecurity and you say like, oh yeah, I work with hackers. You get the exact same response. So I want you to replace the person with pink hair and imagine that with hackers. So what basically what I've been trying to show case here is that because there is this imagery and language being used as a, basically scaring people, um, it's created a socially constructed belief in most people around the world that hackers are bad people. They're criminals. When in reality, that's not the case. There's another thing for that. It's called cyber criminals, but hackers are not that. They're there trying to save the world and protect the world by keeping data safe and reporting of possible breaches. And what's resulting because of it is that it's this mindset by society that by people in the media that's keeping us unsafe and preventing hackers what they do well in. 
And companies are afraid of hackers and don't want to create vulnerable disclosure policies because of a lack of bilateral trust amongst hackers and organizations and government. It is one of the reasons why 60% do not report vulnerabilities. And hackers are scared of outdated laws such as CFA and DMCA. And I promise I'll go into that. And yes, there are U.S. laws, but I promise it also touches on all around the world at the same time. And you're probably wondering, where does that 60% statistic come from? That actually came from Amit Elzari. She was one of the first people to look into safe harbor. I did research around why people don't report vulnerabilities. And it was out of prosecution. Also from interviewing black hat hackers, one of the reasons they decide to move away from ethical hacking is the pay and the constant worry of being prosecuted regardless if they did something legal. This is also said similarly by those who switch from being a black hat hacker to an ethical hacker. The reason they switched was the insomnia of being arrested because there are cases when organizations prosecute ethical hackers regardless if they were in scope so I want to dive into worldwide legislation. And yes, this is kind of US centric, but also anti-hacking laws, anti-circumvention laws, acceptable use policy are found in every single country around the world. So I'm going to use the US ones to show an example. So what is anti-hacking laws? Basically, it means that it's a law that prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or an excess of authorization. And this is usually used when a researcher goes a scope. It's the act to prosecute hacking. Now, a little quick random fact, which I love, is if you've seen war games, believe it or not, that movie contributed to CFAA coming about. Because Ronald Reagan, he watched it. He freaked out about hackers and pushed for the CFA to happen. Now, anti-circumvention laws, these are the copyright laws. Basically, the right to repair. Reverse engineering is seen as a breach of property to some companies. Now, who here in the room has ever read their terms and conditions for Apple products? Okay, I'll be honest, I tried, I got really, really bored, and I decided to watch a movie instead. But in general, they can be long and too much verbiage. It can confuse anyone, especially if English is not their first language, and even if they're not an attorney, believe it or not. And this is the reason why this can lead to serious miscommunication issues for ethical hackers who don't really speak English and are not really a lawyer. And by the way, I know I'm talking about laws and everything, but I just want to put out there, I am not an attorney. I tried to go to law school one day, but then I realized it wasn't for me. So... Please note, I'm not an attorney. But overall, the main takeaway from this slide is that these laws are really old and out of date. And honestly, they were created out of fear, not empathy by taking the time to understand what is needed and why laws should only prosecute malicious actors, AKA criminals and not good hackers. Because when we do have improvements to legislation, Every single Forbes Global 2000 will have a vulnerability disclosure policy. And with improvement in legislation, we can change that previous slide completely. But in order to do that, we need to dive into three categories in which we've touched on because they've worked together to bring about a public change. And that is, how do we influence the public cycle? So in order to have rights for hackers, we need to get the public on board. In order to do so, we need to dive into these three categories. And these three categories will help shape and change what the socially constructed belief is of what a hacker looks like and does. So in order to do that, we need the press to push for public to become aware. In other words, we need to change the language and imagery of a hacker and start using cyber criminals for those who commit unethical hacking. Of our really separate the two. In order to help the press, organizations need to be on board with bilateral trust, with having vulnerability disclosure programs. By showing they support hackers, the public changes their view in general. And lastly, to have organizations and public opinion to push and motivate Capitol Hill to get on board and update the current legislation that will protect ethical hackers. Overall, we need all three to be supporting hacker rights for it to become a reality. Overall, we need to push for awareness of ethical hackers, and these are the five needs to get there. Now, how we get there, I'm gonna need you. The first step together is this petition was created at the end of February to try to change the situation, and it is on change.org. 
It is a petition for anyone out there that supports ethical hackers and want to bring about a change. It's the first step that I'm working on to bring attention to this matter. And yes, it's broken down by organizations, legislators, the media, the hacker community. Anyone can sign whoever agrees with it. Now we need to get to more than a thousand signatures for me to be able to take this further. So I just wanna go over this really quickly so then you have an idea of what you're signing. So in the end, it talks about everything that I've discussed in here um, without the cognitive science part, because that's, that's already ingrained in us. Um, but basically for organizations, it's for them to implement policies that clearly define the scope, what kind, if any, of rewards, contact information, communicate updates on submission, and extension of bilateral trust to include non-retribution. And the reason why we need to have something like that right now, it's because sometimes we find a, something and we want to report it, but sometimes it takes hours, days, sometimes weeks, and then we get to a point where should I even risk it? I don't want to get prosecuted for this, but it's really needed. Now, the other thing is sometimes we submit a vulnerability and we're waiting to know if it's been updated. Has it been like fixed? We want to know um, because we're caring about the public and that's why we reported it. It's really important to be very transparent on, on everything. And that's how you build trust is transparency. Now, the other part is politicians. We need politicians to get to know ethical hackers instead of seeing them as cyber criminals because they still see us as cyber criminals. And because of that, there's no push for new legislation and there's no push for game product like protective additions to current legislation that won't penalize us. So this is really important to do, is to make sure that we have something like that. So we need politicians to be aware of it, and the only way we're gonna get politicians aware of it is when organizations and media and the public push for it. And last but not least, media, you know, we need them to stop portraying ethical hackers as malicious actors and change the imagery. That means they need to refer them to cyber criminals, not hackers. And last but not least, of course, I had to add the hacker community. We all need to stay within scope. And even if we accidentally go out of scope or whatnot, please don't exploit. Because when you exploit this, then a trust is broken. And then it's very hard for all of us to go back to how things were. So we need everyone to be part of this. That means don't break the trust. If you do, you ruin everything for everyone else. So this is the one thing we need to do. So it'd be great if you guys can sign this petition, share it around, share it with your friends, your family, your infosec folks. It doesn't matter if they are or not. The most important thing is that we need people to start seeing that we're serious about this and things need to change like immediately and it should have been changed a long time ago. So the main takeaways from this is that we, overall, we need to push for awareness of ethical hackers. And this is the one thing, is that ethical hackers deserve protection and rights. And the current imagery and language has been misleading the public. We need to work together to change the public's perception by updating legislation, media, organizations. We also need to sign and share that petition that I just shared with you previously. And feel free to share this talk. It's very important. But most importantly, if you remember from the brain, is that the change starts with you and me. We have to look at ourselves and see what am I doing that's making the situation better and worse, and then do whatever it takes to change that. And if you have questions, even better, because questions are the things that make you active of learning. And that's good, you want to ask questions. If we don't ask questions, then we're never learning and we never change the world that we live in. So always ask the question, but also look at yourself. Here are some resources that I like to share. Um, I am on a podcast uh, with Alyssa Miller and Phil Wiley. We do the Uncommon Journey podcast with ITSP Magazine. Basically, we uh, interview people that you tend to follow on Twitter about their journey getting into InfoSec and their takeaways and their advice. Um, the Hacker Book Club it meets once again once a week on a Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And right now we're about to cover car hacking. And then the following week, I think we're going to be reading The Undead Cow. Um, the ethical hacker rights petition is still there. And then the last four are just because of COVID-19 time. We're dealing with, you know, a crisis when it comes to mental health. Um, so if you can hold on to those four numbers, I know that these are U.S.-based numbers and U.K.-based as well. 
but it'd be great if you guys can hold on to it and then share it with anyone that you know in the US because it might save someone's life. Overall, I just want to say thank you guys for existing and thank you to the conference and the wonderful people that have put this all together virtually. And I really can't wait to see all of you guys in person next year. And in the meantime, please stay safe. I hope you're all doing well. Your families are okay. If you need anything, feel free to reach out to me. No one should feel isolated or alone during this time. And if you're looking for resources, just DM me. My DMs are always open. More than happy to help you out. Once again, I just want to say a big thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to put my camera on so you guys can see my face again because I think seeing people's faces is something really important so we kind of see more of who this person is and what they're like and we tell a lot from someone from their eyes. Um, I just want to say thank you again and I hope you're all staying safe and honestly, please don't like be concerned and worried like to reach out reach out. If you, if there's ever a moment you're like doubting, like, Oh, I shouldn't reach out. No, just reach out. Trust me. I've been there before. I felt isolated once before in InfoSec, but the community is there and they're very supportive. And so if you need anything, just reach out. Um, and yeah, thank you guys. And I hope to see you in person next year and take care. Bye now.